Hello and thank you all for joining us in this, the final webinar in the series focused on coronavirus shopping trends. The world is starting to resemble normality again. Friends are on holiday, colleagues have returned to the office and bars and restaurants are full once more. Whilst we may not be out of the woods just yet with further localised lockdowns initiated, consumers are getting used to living with the virus and habits have started to settle into much more of a routine. Today, we're looking back at the 10 key learnings from the past few months and what digital marketers can do to use these learnings to create strategies for the months ahead. I'm Ros Beresford, the Client Partnerships Director here at AWIN UK, and I'm joined again by our sector specialists. We've got Joelle Hillman, the Retail and Travel Partner, Alex Palmer-Yi, our Telco and Finance Partner, and Jessica Brown, our Agency Partner. We will end the session with a live Q&A and you can submit questions all the way through the webinar by using the toolbar in the middle of the screen and select the show Q&A icon. A chat bar will open up on the side of the screen for you to type in your question or comment and you can also upvote questions submitted by others. So to kick off, the first learning to share with you today is the real importance of an easy customer journey. In a recent article, I explored how the SARS epidemic in China really kick-started e-commerce for them. That was back in 2003, and since then, growth has been fueled by a real focus on easy customer journeys. The affiliate channel can offer a number of solutions to improve these, so things like deep linking or supporting in-app tracking or ensuring postcode checkers or other pre-qualifying information can be passed through to the advertiser basket. But there are also some really exciting and innovative publisher, publisher solutions such as increasingly.com who use AI to make it easy for customers to find complementary products without leaving the basket. These enable customers to build their bundle as can be seen on screen. So for example, you could select the men's jacket and have that in your basket and then complementary products like the short sleeve t-shirt or jacket can then be added in there and there. Chinese company also forged the way in digital payment solutions and we're really starting to see more UK brands offer multiple payment solutions such as Apple Play and Klarna. Awin data showed that for one retailer during the pandemic, Klarna payments increased 64% in lockdown from 9% in January up to 14% in March and they had an AOV of 34% higher than the programme average. So as digital marketers, we need to embrace these technologies and make sure the journey is as easy as possible. And this has a threefold effect of one, making the new customers that we've gained during the pandemic come back, two, increase conversion rates and three, drive these higher AOVs. So a key area to consider when focusing on the ease of online journeys is device. And the next learning looks at how the changing role of mobile, mobile and desktop and how that happened during the pandemic. So it's safe to say most of us have witnessed continued year on year increases in mobile sales and that's certainly been echoed across the AWIN network. However, the pandemic meant that customers have been stuck at home and spending much more time browsing on larger devices. This was most starkly shown in the first two weeks of lockdown where the proportion of desktop traffic increased to 42% compared to only 33% in the same period last year. However, this increase in desktop traffic did affect its conversion rate, which was 3% lower than last year, because customers seem to be using these larger devices to browse, but not necessarily to purchase. When looking at device split for a young, longer time period and for H1, which can be seen to the right of the screen, we can again see there's this clear shift in March, but mobile traffic share pushed back up again in April, but then again had some decline since. So it's really clearly in flux. When considering how this should influence strategy, it's worth remembering that mobile doesn't just offer convenience when out on the go, but also convenience when in the home too, whether that's second screening when watching TV or finding recipes when cooking. So whilst the increase in remote working has certainly led to more monitors being used in the home office setup, it's not where we want to spend our evenings browsing for purchases. Therefore, larger strategic changes to device strategy should be considered alongside other factors. A good example being the change in pattern of peak sale hours and Alex is going to talk us through that a little bit later. So I'll now hand over to Joelle. He's going to take us through how basket size has been impacted over the last few months at a sector level. Thanks Ros. During the last six months we've not only seen a shift in customer journey but also customer spend. 
and across retail, many subsectors have seen an increase in AOV as a result. This slide showcases the changing AOV in Q2 of 2020 versus 2019. Clothing. Clothing saw a 22% increase in AOV, seeing the average basket value hit £64 last quarter. In a webinar three months back, you might recall we analysed the clothing landscape on a subsector level, and menswear and children's wear took the edge over women's wear. Another continued trend we have seen is the rise of home sports equipment right from the very day that the gym shut. AAV for the last quarter was up 17% year on year, hitting £161. It's clear here that exercise is definitely an area in which consumers are happy to invest in. Next up, in line with the schools closing, we have toys and games. And as parents began to homeschool, keeping their children entertained was key. AAV went up 7% year on year to £65. Fast moving consumer goods reached £38 AOV in Q2 2020, and that was 7% up versus the previous year. This increase in spend has been driven by some of the large UK grocers, the big takeaway brands, those home recipe kits, as well as some emerging beer, vape and gourmet food delivery services. The health and beauty sector was also up 7% year on year, hitting £49 last quarter. Research focused on the beauty sector found luxury retailers were seeing volumes up 190% in the height of the pandemic compared to last year, whilst the more everyday beauty retailers, so those selling more functional beauty, were up just 18%. When looking at a product level for those retailers who sold both luxury and everyday throughout June, the top products sold were the more expensive face concentrates and makeup sets. When we look at May, the top sellers were hand and foot creams. And if we look back further to the beginning of the pandemic, we saw functional beauty items such as cotton wool pads and hair products take the lead. The importance of looking and feeling good and supporting our mental health in this difficult time such as a pandemic really shouldn't be underestimated. And it should especially be considered in our digital strategy as we begin to plan for Q4. Sportswear rose specifically alongside the success of sports equipment, surpassing the average clothing AOV and hitting £75 in Q2 versus 64 for the wider clothing sector. Moving on to electrical, however, we saw this AOV lower during the pandemic compared to last year, down 21%. Within electronics, white goods and audiovisual saw a bigger drop, down 32%, whilst computing and gadgets, less so, down 20% and 11% consecutively. This offers interesting insights into the areas that consumers are prepared to spend more on during the pandemic. Whilst a larger freezer may have been a practical buy, consumers actually spent more year on year on apparel, beauty, toys, and of course, food and alcohol at home. And finally, office supplies with more professionals than ever working from home and offices across the UK redundant for most of Q2, it's unsurprising to see AOV drop year on year by 28%. Jess will go on to discuss this trend in more detail later on. This slide demonstrates the importance of reacting quickly during these extraordinary times. And here we're looking specifically at travel bookings and spend from the beginning of lockdown to date. Each daily government briefing and live broadcast from the Prime Minister announced new rules. Brands had to react quickly and at scale, whether it was closing hundreds of stores or scaling warehouse capacity to meet the additional online demand. There was one sector that felt the impact of the virus more than most, and of course, that was the travel industry. With travel severely restricted and the vast majority of passengers told to stay home, AWIN reported volumes of over 98% reduction in terms of travel sales last year versus last year at the height of the lockdown. As quickly as restrictions were implemented, they were also relifted. And of the, as of the 4th of July, there has been recent movement again within the sector. Those companies that reacted quickly with speed have seen fantastic growth figures, as demonstrated in this graph, here plotting advertiser spend alongside bookings. 
travel advertisers and publishers needed to focus on travel within the UK or to countries easily accessible to the UK and without quarantine rules. They had to be clear about how they were going to keep their travellers safe. The Pulse recently reported that the UK brand Snaptrip enjoyed 182% year-on-year increases in that very first week of July. And Awin is now only 50 to 60% down on last year in terms of investment within the travel industry versus the plus 90% decrease that we saw at the height of the lockdown. The affiliate channel is fantastic at supporting the speed of movement needed within this current climate, whether it's turning on technology partners without the need for a lengthy tech integration or using incentive partners to drive real impact and quickly. Discount partners drove 49% of bookings for travel in July, shortly followed by cashback at 23% and editorial at 10%. These publisher types can make a huge impact on their audiences really quickly and at scale. They also offer money conscious consumers the incentive to convert, whilst also offering budget management and offer caps for advertisers. Making the most of the speed of access to multiple technologies, multiple media and the diverse range of promotional types is vital to react quickly to whatever the pandemic throws at us next. I'll now pass you over to Alex, who will share insight into the changing role of the high street. Thank you, Joel. Uh, so speaking of reacting quickly, one area brands had to move really sort of quite rapidly on was was the role of their physical stores when they had them, uh, if they had them during the retail lockdown. Consumers still needed access to the goods, and if they weren't going to get them in person, they had to move online. So some stores obviously had quite different approaches to this. Some stores uh, sort of integrated their physical locations as part of their online fulfillment, uh, with stores acting almost as local warehouses and distribution centers. Other brands looked at integrating with services such as Deliveroo, um, particularly actually you saw this within groceries, where again, trying to get uh, sort of the goods from their stores uh, to someone without that, that human contact there. However, we also saw some really interesting uh, sort of changes, particularly among, among some of the AWIN advertisers in terms of moving some of these offline experiences online. So one example was uh, Free, the mobile phone brand. Uh, they, they introduced Free Store Now, um, which replaced sort of the, the in-store experience, so the in-store product demos with live video, um, as well as obviously video sort of chats with uh, store uh, sales assistants. Selfridges um, provided one-on-one -on -one beauty consultations over video chat as well. So again, really sort of moving these physical experiences uh, online uh, during the retail lockdown. So with this graph here, I thought it'd be interesting to look at how brands on AWIN with a sizable physical store presence across the UK performed. Now, one thing to caveat about this data is I've deliberately removed supermarkets as I wanted to focus on what's maybe seen as less essential retail. So supermarkets online volumes have been widely documented as being at all time highs. And if they were including this graph, it potentially would hide some of the, the data here. So the, retail, the impact of the retail lockdown is a real clear impact. Um, with April, if we look at April, it's 87% up year on year uh, for the brands included in this, uh, in this uh, sample. And then in, uh, uh, in May, it was 103%, so growing even further. So it really shows that whilst there were obviously online only brands with lower overheads, and lower costs, who really capitalized on the increase in the number of consumers online, it shows that many consumers remained loyal to their high street regulars um, and, and, and sort of continued to shop there and as shown by this huge sort of increase year on year. We've now had a few months of retail stores being reopened. And whilst we may see have seen a, a fall in this or a, a reduction in this gap, the data suggests that there's still a huge number of consumers who are continuing to shop with these brands online. Perhaps they're hesitant to go in store or have been converted into online shoppers. Now, I'm not going to pretend that the importance of linking online and offline journeys is, is a new thing. It's, it's something we've talked about for a number of years now. But with so many offline customers uh, being sort of pushed to online, I think it's, it's, it's again, it, it re-raises the importance of, of looking into how you can link up offline and online journeys. There's obviously the baseline, which is click and collect, and that'll, that'll obviously be the main foray, I imagine, for a lot of brands here. But there's obviously the, the, the opportunity to embrace technology to link up online and offline journeys, uh, be that through card linking or other such solutions. And depending on what 
your brand's physical retail will look like. There may also be uh, a sort of a case for trying to also move offline sh shoppers back online with stores maybe acting as a sort of key brand touch points or or showrooms. Um, so there's there's a real sort of change here in in the role that physical retail can play and how it can interact with online. So uh, the retailers with physical stores were not the only parties concerned about their closures. Brands that were stocked within them were not able to reach their loyal customers. And this led to some really interesting trends here, actually, particularly within food, where consumers early on in the lockdown struggled to get their usual baskets of foods. And, and the brands, uh, food brands here can rely on being seen on the shelf uh, to go and sort of get to those customers. And it really led to some interesting online experiences from some unlikely uh, sort of parties. Now, when I say WWW in reference to Heinz, you probably think I'm just listing out the letters in my alphabet spaghetti. Yet, Heinz launched a new direct to consumer e commerce site in response to the lockdown, Heinz to the Home, meaning that consumers could get their favorite uh, products straight from the source. I mean, source. Um, another heritage food brand that that sort of capitalized on, and we saw sort of capitalizing trend was Lint, uh, the chocolatiers, and they saw sweet success from launching a direct to consumer site in, a, in, in, a, in only a few days. So there's obviously, it's really, really interesting to go and see that these brands, which have maybe never considered uh, what their sort of consumer relationship is beyond, I guess, their brand messaging, sort of really embracing an e-commerce journey here. And when we look at some of the AWIN examples, on, our, on AWIN, we, we have our access tier, um, which has been a really, really popular, and we've seen well over 100 program launches um, since March, and that number continues to grow. And the, and the AX, AWIN Access has become a thriving hub of direct-to-consumer brands, uh, covering everything from healthy foods to hair, remover, hair removal, from mascara to masks. Direct consumer online experiences are likely to continue to grow, and consumers are really using this sort of big shift to online to embrace the freedom that it gives them to buy direct from the brands they love. Um, and so this is evidenced by the data we're seeing on AWIN. 20% of these access accounts that have launched see a sale within their first day. And the, the average sale uh, sale active time from launch is, is sort of under 12 days. So it's, it's really, really impressive to go and see um, how much traction direct to consumer is making. Um, and these brands may be smaller due to serving really, really particular niches. But if you're a publisher, it's really worth thinking about how you can work with these sites that are gaining real traction with consumers. And it's definitely been accelerated even further during the lockdown. So I've looked a bit about where and how we're shopping, but what about the, uh, the when? So you may be familiar with the graph on the left if you've joined uh, a previous webinar. Um, and I've added a bit more extra data here to go and um, tell the more recent story. So online shopping has the convenience factor, which means that the times between work and play are where we tend to see the volumes. On, on the sales by hour trend graph on the left, we see uh, in the midst of lockdown, we saw that 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., um, and you can sort of tell that by uh, looking at sort of April and May particularly, uh, became sort of the new online shopping peak, meaning that the post-work uh, evening shop sort of dropped in share um, and that that sort of historically prior to lockdown and looking at previous years had always been quite a popular time. Um, so with more daytime offline shoppers moving online and with uh, remote working potentially allowing that flexibility to shop in between uh, the odd email here and there, there was obviously no need to focus uh, buying into the evenings and concentrate your purchases decisions there. And so that's that was a real shift that we talked about earlier on in lockdown. Now, we're obviously at a stage where shops and offices are beginning to reopen, and we've seen um, a shift back to some level of normality there. So we've seen the evening shopper again starting to pick up. But in general, um, if you look at the, the most recent data, uh, so particularly July, you can see that it's just a bit more of an even distribution between 9 a.m. up until uh, 9 p.m. So those 12 hours, again, it's a lot less spiky. Um, in terms of the prominence of each day, um, this is often shaped by weekend activities, with Saturday being the smallest day whilst people are out and about enjoying their weekends. And then Sunday, with uh, obviously Sunday trading, limiting the physical retail, offer end dates and potentially the odd hangover um, being a, a, a quite a big peak in online. And, and, and you can tell by the graph on the right, you can see how, how it, um, Sunday is the biggest day um, in January and, and, and February. Um, so. 
Um, and then, and then, in terms of the weekdays, they they obviously tend to be a bit more variable based on office uh, times and and etc. From that side, um, so these assumptions often shape when uh, brands run their promotion or when publishers send their newsletters. But with restrictions on socialising, the shape of the week has changed quite dramatically, and you can see this by this jumble of wires in 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 the graph here. Uh, so these. Um, so with the restriction, so we saw obviously the smaller days that the ones that again were less popular sort of grow quite a lot. And it, it probably just shows evidence that when we shopped was no lim longer limited by the free time we had. I think we all had a lot of additional free time on our hands, um, regardless of our whether we worked or were at school or um, or were staying at home. So each month uh, brought about more changes and as things have become a bit more normal, leisure obviously has started to resume a little bit. So you, people are now starting to use their Saturdays to go out and the nice weather has certainly helped with that. Um, but you can just see that obviously the, the, the ranking of each day of the week has, has changed quite dramatically and Sunday is definitely a lot smaller. So the key takeaway here, it's a bit less clear than maybe some of the other slides, but it's that although online shopping is accessible anytime and anywhere, that's important to go and really consider what uh, what consumer behavior is at the time when you're when you're planning uh, campaign launch times or or, or activity uh, schedules there um, and really sort of make sure you're adapting con to consumer social behavior especially in in sort of current times where there's sort of unprecedented changes in in behavior and the restrictions there so as as uh, the society develops it's really important to go and uh, make sure your marketing plans do too so I'm going to hand over to Jess, who's going to talk, uh, provide us with a bit of insight on the B2B market. Thanks, Alex. So looking at the change in positioning of retailers within the business to business sector, previously there were a clear target market and content that solely caters to companies facing large scale orders on bulk, which was evident if you visited some of the top performing B2B advertiser pages going into the lockdown. However, we saw the shift come with the emergence of a new mass market made up of the individual lockdown home office workers ordering equipment for themselves. Products and supplies were suddenly in demand from a nation working from home, and we've seen a new subsector evolve as B2B becomes a business to business to consumer market. Desk chairs and office equipment, coffee machines and commercial services such as tech support were all among the top performing product groups as a new remote worker becomes fully equipped to continue business as usual from their makeshift desks to kitchen tables and spare room offices, much like I'm presenting to you now from. The slide shows B2B retailer trends looking at AOV and sales metrics over three key periods. So pre-lockdown, when we saw a higher AOV and lower sales volume, the height of lockdown, with the average AOV decreasing by 28%, as Joelle mentioned, and average sales growing by 22%, and post-lockdown, with easing of restrictions for offices to begin to reopen. Since this time, we've seen an increase in demand with pre-COVID AOV restored and the continuation of higher sales volume versus pre-lockdown performance. Taking this into account, a seamless B2B retailer journey that caters for smaller purchasing customers looking for business related product ranges should now also be a focus for newly positioned sector. And business sector advertisers who are quick to adapt and optimise these journeys over lockdown will have reaped the rewards in the increased sales supported by the trends outlined. Furthermore, a decline in conversion rates alongside the surge in traffic for the B2B sector overall presents a strong call to action and a learning we can all take away as a focus area for optimization for B2B clients, as well as retailers who stock businesses centric product category ranges, this would also be relevant. Our recommendations for business retailers to enhance unit journeys alongside the increase in demand from home working relevant products and develop a B2B consumer acquisition approach for continued growth within the customer pool mentioned. One of the immediate ways to do so is by repositioning affiliate activity away from heavy email lead gen and cashback focus to include a more B2C partner type such as content and promotion, which will result in a positive uplift in conversion rate and engage the revised target market. The question we need to determine is whether a customer is purchasing on behalf of a business or for themselves, and to serve the best experience accordingly, this will be key to unlocking the increased rate of conversion.
Since restrictions has been lifted, the early indicators show that with offices reopening on a limited basis, there will be a culture of remote working in the UK after many businesses, including Google, have decided to close their office doors after productivity, employee work-life balance and general well-being has all reportedly increased. This is positive news for the B2B retailers who adapt their positioning for to continued growth. We will now look at what part brand ambassadors play in the affiliate channel and how they can be utilised with key partners. During our COVID webinar series, there has been a movement of ambassadors into the affiliate channel, with 56% of internet users spending more time than ever on social media throughout March. We decided to explore this further with our in-house influencer team and have highlighted some key stats over the COVID period, which you can see on screen now. It's no secret that social engagement soared during lockdown and we saw TikTok global downloads increase 12% in a single week, with short form video content providing a form of escapism for major markets such as the UK and US. As a result of influencers adaptability to the pandemic, brands are changing initial strategies to include more social ambassador activity. This alongside a decline in in-store shoppers, limited advertising reach outside the home and a downturn in paid social has driven a new era of small creators emerging as bigger influencers. Performance based app developers have also started using the influencers to help drive downloads with demand for direct ROI and working on a cost per install basis increasing. And with a 76% increase in daily accumulated likes on Instagram over a two week period, we can see why. Finance companies, particularly in the US, are using influencer marketing to enhance brand image and for brand building. It will be interesting to see if this is a short term contingency plan or a new era for influencers with 56% of internet users providing more time than ever on social media throughout March, the latter is more likely. And omni-channel influencer campaigns with the decline in out-of-home advertising is leaving a gap in ad spend that we can see increase with brand ambassadors within the digital landscape. This provides a captive and receptive audience for marketers. Consumers have had more time to browse content and influencers have more time to create it over the past few months. For brands, influencers pose several opportunities. They allow many brands to continue personal relationships with consumers in an informal environment that has been lost through the sales assistant in the store. Influencers also allowed for the continuation of consumer to consumer referrals during a time of no real life social interactions and brand experiences to consumers for a different medium during the months without high street. The pandemic also created budget challenges and budgeting for the unknown is no mean feat. Many brands move larger ambassadors into the affiliate channel to cement the fundamentals of performance marketing into these campaigns, allowing for transparency, measurement and fair reward. As mentioned, Awin have a dedicated influencer specialist and award winning influencer platform solution and measurement and reward metrics beyond last click. Cookie list tracking features ensure no performance metrics are lost through complex social platform journeys. The rise of the influencer was here before COVID-19 and will be here to stay far behind beyond the outbreak. And whether you have had always had an influencer strategy or are just beginning to test the waters, your future strategy incorporating the right content, insight and reward will be imperative to future success for your brand ambassadors. Aside from brand ambassadors, how else does the world of affiliates offer advertisers a new source of revenue? Well, as the digital channel continues to soar upwards with ongoing ad spending cuts announced for out of home and print media and further decline due to the impact of lockdown, we took a look at the rate of new partnerships as online marketing moves into the spotlight and we see the performance channel pick up momentum. New sources of online revenue generation have been welcomed for many businesses needing to adapt quickly with COVID-19 physical store closures. For affiliate marketers, a high average return on investment of around 16.1% on average versus the wider digital marketing mix makes for a great case study to grow advertiser online ad spend. On the network, we have seen a sharp rise in signups highlighted on screen now. So the UK was up 103%, which was the largest increase versus the top five markets across AWIN, with Italy as the second largest growing up 83%, and US and Spain in joint third increasing by 63%, with Australia increasing 60% after that.
This influx of new customers are on hand to promote and support new advertisers joining the channel, and the increase has been driven in part by Amazon's May 2020 update, where the marketplace giant made changes to their commission structure, which prompted many affiliates to look for alternative ways to promote. In addition to new publishers, there has been a surge in new ways of working and a sense of flexibility across the industry as we see brands moving into affinity partnerships. This is a fantastic way for mature affiliate programmes to diverse, diversify their strategy and reach a new pool of relevant and interested customers. If you're interested in hearing more about new partner opportunities and affinity partnerships, you can reach out to the client partner team or your dedicated aim and point of contact. Now to round off our webinar series, I'll now hand over to Alex for a live Q&A. Thank you, Jess. Um, so um, thank you all for listening as we've taken you through the latest insights. The pandemic has taught us to expect the unexpected, but that with the right strategies, online marketers can hope can be hopeful for a positive H2. It's been a fantastic uh, a fantastic, a fascinating few months, uh, uncovering a variety of insights uh, regarding the rapidly changing nature of spending habits, um, both uh, by consumers and digital marketers alike. The key learnings from the pandemic thus far have all had one common factor, the strength and resilience of the affiliate channel and its ability to flex in line with the ever-changing demands of the online marketplace. Thank you to uh, those who've submitted questions already. Um, do continue to submit questions if you there's still plenty of uh, space for more questions um, via the Q&A uh, function um, and I'll also upvote uh, those that you would like asked. Um, so the first one that's come in, um, and I think I'm going to direct that at Roz, is um, do you think that with a recession up, uh, incoming, so the latest figures obviously suggest that the UK has entered recession, um, that we will see similar trends to those that we saw in 2008. So I think there's there's a number of trends uh, that happened in the affiliate channel in 2008 um, around specific publisher growth and, and growth of the channel. But um, yeah, Ros, I don't know if you uh, had uh, wanted to add some some thing to that. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Alex. It's actually a topic that I want to kind of delve into in, in a bit more detail. So give me a month and I'll probably have a better answer for you. But I think 2008 was a long time ago, especially when we consider how much the publisher mix has changed since then. It was a time where, you know, the, the rise of the, the code sites was really, really prevalent. Um, I was actually working in the industry back then, and it was definitely where we saw that shift from kind of PPC being in the very early days through to then cashback and code in these kind of late 2000s, which obviously tied in with the recession. I think those publisher types are, uh, types are, are still incredibly strong, but I, I don't think we'll potentially see the growth that we did in those types like we did back in 2008. Um, um, but I do think that the fact that there's such a, a breadth of publishers now is, is hopefully going to be positive in terms of the fact that the channel is a fantastic place to spend during a recession. It's performance. It's really safe. You know that um, you know advertising pennies are going to go a long way. We know the return on investment is really good. So I think in terms of publisher mix, I don't think we'll maybe see one type grow in the same way that we did back in 2008. But I definitely think it could actually be positive for the channel as we've kind of seen through the last few months with people more people shopping online and um, it's such a safe place to invest but I'm really interested to see if there is potential affiliate types that do really kind of shine out and and have a, a bigger growth than we would see if, if we weren't kind of going into this recession period. Yeah I mean one one point I guess I, I'd like to add on to that so I think I, I, I wasn't working in affiliate marketing, caveat, I wasn't working in affiliate marketing in 2008. But um, from my understanding, obviously, what, one of the areas that really thrived in 2008 were, were obviously um, publisher types that, that added and, and, and helped consumers save, I think, particularly when, um, when budgets were sort of tight and stuff from that side. And I do think that, um, and, and we, saw, we, had, we had a publisher on um, the global finance webinar uh, for the AWIN group that we hosted a, a couple of months ago, but I think one publisher type that potentially hasn't necessarily reached its full potential and may see that accelerated are publishers who are intelligently informing consumers how to spend. So um, they've got apps uh, such as Snoop, um, but also the online banking apps where they've integrated the ability where it monitors your spending and advises you on maybe how to save money. And I think intelligent spending solution, uh, saving solutions um, potentially could sort of 
see a real sort of uh, resurgence, I think, over over the period. But, um, but as I said, yeah, it may not be as dramatic as uh, as 2008, which I think is widely credited with like a, quite a huge shift within the channel. Um, but yeah, it will be really interesting to see. Um, so uh, we'll go on to the next question. Um, so um, this question is from Anonymous and it says, how are we able to evaluate successful partnerships um, when impressions are not often a tracked metric? So I guess this is um, this is sort of talking about um, maybe some of the, the less traditional uh, partnerships um, from that side. Um, Joelle, I don't know if you, you had any thoughts um, at all from, from this. Yeah, sure. So I think it's it's tracking's always been on our radar, right? We're a performance marketing network. So I think we're already making real strides here. So I think the, the assist reporting was the first step here, which we released in 2014. Now where we're starting to understand what's happening beyond the last click. But impressions is definitely the next part there. So we've actually run some case studies previously. So we did it a couple of years ago with um, a fashion brand and four content publishers. And when we looked at impression tracking, we saw um, uh, attributed sales, if we were looking at impression value, go up by that 98%. And we investigated this down to a product level. And actually the, the um, interaction between the content and the product they were purchasing was completely unmatched. So if the content was about a pair of shoes, more often than not, the purchase was a pair of shoes. And um, we did the same with uh, some lipstick content and found consumers um, who um, we um, tracked an impression on through that content were purchasing a specific lipstick. So there really is an influence there that we, we need to begin to track. Um, AWIN do have the ability to do this, um, so we have the ability for our publisher master tag, um, which we recently took to market and we're seeing really strong uptake, but um, disclaimer is that we're not live with every publisher, so that's sort of where we want to be. The second stage of that is making sure that we understand impressions alongside other channels and not just ourselves. So the publisher master tag allows us to track impressions through our channel. Um, but what we are looking to do as a network is actually pass that in, uh, information into our um, strategic attribution partner, which is single view and make sure that we're being fairly represented alongside our competition in terms of the, the other marketing channels when it comes to the way in which we are measured. Well, thank you very much, and hopefully that answered your question. Um, those asked. Um, so, um, Joel, I, I, well, I think it would be interesting to hear maybe from from both our sides, um, just because of uh, maybe with a sector focus. But it's um, the question is: Do you think that buying patterns uh, are going to continue? Are going to change for Q4? as with recession, uh, people would rather spend on essential products. Um, so I know Roz obviously uh, covered uh, some of the recession stuff there. Um, I mean, from from my perspective, um, from looking at the finance and the, the telecom sector um, specifically, um, I think tel in telco, I guess telco has become more of an essential product. And, and one of the things that um, we've spoken about quite at length, uh, again, in previous webinars is um, how premium telco products are seen as a bit more essential. So um, I think people whilst working at home, but also relying on uh, the internet for entertainment have been buying a lot more sort of, um, uh, sort of premium things there. But I guess obviously that on the flip side, that needs that balance there. Um, I think there's a lot of economic theory about what um, uh, and, and sort of hypothesis around what people buy in terms of services. So um, there's, there's, there's an argument that consumers will buy more sort of paid television products to replace going out and stuff like that so i think yeah there probably is going to be some buying pattern changes there um within finance uh, so if we look at things like insurance and stuff again it's very much linked to what people are buying so home insurance is really heavily linked to house purchases and again i i, I could imagine that again that that will probably see an, an impact maybe with lower premiums or um or, or less activity there um as as the recession sort of takes place but that's my perspective from telco and finance joel i don't know if retail and travel if you have any thoughts on on um what people might spend their money on in q4 yeah sure so i suppose um specifically in relation to the recession question um i i definitely think we're, we're going to expect to see changes and the additional layer of 
predicting our future here is if we go into any more future lockdowns. So that's really where we've seen the trends across retail specifically in terms of lockdown rules and the severity of the lockdown is where we've started to see really, really differences in, in the subsectors. Um, I think just last week, Retail Week mentioned that groceries online have only just got back to um, normal levels in terms of what they were seeing pre-COVID-19. Um, so we're just starting to see that level out. But I would again expect that to potentially go back up if we do go into any sort of future lockdown throughout the winter. Um, and then obviously we've seen quite a lot of news um, in the retail space just in terms of job cuts. Um, and I do think the the number of people um, that might be struggling in terms of um, revenue coming in in Q4 means that that will impact some of our AOVs and overall spending. And that will definitely hit the travel space as well because travel is, is often a luxury purchase. You know, holidays aren't necessary. So that will that might be where we'll begin to see the pinch again towards the, the, the latter end of this year. I think something that we do have to look forward to, however, is Black Friday. Like we've all been saying, what we think consumers will be leaning towards is more sensible spending, looking for those offers and looking for those discounts. And Black Friday and Cyber Monday is going to pose huge opportunities for all of our brands in terms of putting those exciting offers in front of our consumers and making sure that they are purchasing what they need but at a price that's right for them. Thank you very much for that. Um... So, uh, Jess, uh, this question might be a nice one for you to answer. Um, and it says, what do you think is the most positive shopping trend that we've seen happen as a result of COVID? Um, and then the follow up is, and uh, what would be, uh, and with that trend, what would it, is it possible? And that would be a positive to continue despite things returning to normal. So, so essentially, yeah, what's the most positive shopping trend that you'd like to see sort of continue? Well, I think within our team, you all know that the B2B trend is my personal fave because I keep going on about it. But um, I do really like the idea of like a B2B smaller sector. And we've seen this with a couple of sectors, such as some of the smaller artisan food and drink providers and sort of any sector that wasn't huge within Affiliate Martin seems to have really grown um, through the like increased demand and sort of taking up some of that market share where some of the bigger um, sort of main advertisers were um, having to stop um, some of their activity due to the sort of selling out online and and um, not being able to cope with demand so I really like that as a trend and I really hope like some of the partnerships that have been formed off the back of that will continue um, and it sort of opens up a bit of a space for publishers to work with the lesser known brands um, and that sort of continues so that would be sort of my favourite and um, I think it is sort of likely to continue now that they've sort of seen that performance off the back of working with these advertisers partners um, you'd like to think wouldn't just stop working with them it'll be a continued partnership long term um, and with the obviously increase in publishers that means there's more partnerships to be formed off the back of this um, with those massive year-on-year -year numbers um, of like new partners joining the network so um, that's like probably the most positive outcome I would say is the diversity of sectors and um, sort of emerging um, performance off the back of that really. Yeah no definitely and I think it really echoes as well with the, the access point earlier on um, in the webinar um, so this one's got quite a few upvotes um, and it's sort of, I think it's following on from the question uh, that me and Roz uh, uh, that uh, sort of talked a little bit about um, at the start of the Q&A um, was, um, do you think that we'll start to see more offers and discount apps appearing and partnering with publishers? Um, so I guess, yeah, that's in, in reference to um, people, as, said, as we mentioned, obviously on these new technological um, sort of discount uh, apps and things. Um, Roz, I don't know if you, you had any specific thoughts on 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 this sector at all? Um, well, only in that I agree. I think that there probably will be. I think app activity in itself, it still feels like we're really only scratching the surface within the channel. And I think the area that you mentioned earlier in regards to some of the fintechs and the activity that we're seeing across that space, and um, which are essentially mainly app-based activity and how they use the channel and the, the wealth of data that they have, I think it's really exciting about how they can potentially show customers offers that are really personalized to them and can make a big difference so yeah I think I'm really excited to see how this space develops and how we can better support it within the channel and um, there's there's lots that we need to do around understanding app activity around app tracking and um, so I think it's it's definitely an area of growth for the future one that we should all keep a really close eye on yeah 
I think it, it's really, yeah, it's a really interesting point um, from that side. And I, I think, I, I, as I said, I think as well as partnering with publishers, as mentioned the question, I think some of these apps may just sort of go enter straight into the channel. But um, yeah, really interested to see um, how more of these smart uh, saving solutions develop. Um, Ros, this, this one sort of links to a point in your slide um, and it's on Klarna. So it says, with the rise of Klarna, do you see buy now, pay later schemes increasing dominance at the checkout? So, Potentially, yeah, I think we, we are seeing Klarna being used more and more um, by advertisers offering it as a payment solution and by customers taking it up. And I think you know there are some potential concerns around that, around you know, can customers afford to do that, especially you know with, with other talks around the recession. Um, but I think some of the, the good things about Klarna and some of the other providers that they're, they're not adding additional interest it is just an option to split payments. And you know, if you're spending £100, you can have three payments of £33 rather than all of that in one go. So it, it does feel like a safer, potentially a slightly um, easier solution for customers without that then concern about interest rates sort of creeping up and potentially debt rising over time. So I think it's actually a positive that these payment solutions are here now, uh, potentially ahead of, of moving into a recession, that they they could be more of a help than a, in, than a hindrance, which is I think potentially the concern before. And I definitely think in terms of ease of customer journey and having those multiple payment solutions, we definitely should learn from, from our friends over in China that that's, that's that's definitely had a really big impact on the growth of online and um, which you know, they're, they're now set to become the biggest online marketplace in the world overtaking the US. They're seeing really strong growth and they're just really ahead in these types of technologies. So I definitely think it's something to embrace these partnerships and generally across kind of customer journeys and payment solutions. We need to make it as easy as possible for, for customers to pay, you know, particularly if we're, we're all as an industry up against Amazon and you know, kind of the one click buying solutions. So there's definitely Definitely, I think we should be supportive of those solutions that can help consumers, you know, as long as they're not kind of hiding additional costs or, or could be adding any additional concerns for customers. Thank you very much for that. Um, Jess, uh, here's one for you. Um, so you talked a little bit about affinity partnerships in your part, um, in your bit. Um, and the question here is, do, they have, do we have any sort of practical um, ideas or approaches or examples on how large advertiser brands could leverage working with smaller brands on on sort of uh, I guess business to business or advertiser to advertiser partnerships via the affiliate channel. Yeah definitely so um, I think obviously there's affinity partnerships have become a bit of a thing um, within the affiliate marketing at the moment it's something we can really help facilitate and um, there's definitely an opportunity for brands to sort of support each other and complement each other's sort of um, goals within their businesses and who they want to target um, and also like um, releasing new ranges and that might not be um, something that's within their current reach of customers that they could really um, partner up on and sort of um, help to grow that sort of new venture um, so yeah I think there's there's loads of opportunities for that and we're really here as a network to support that and we're sort of gearing up for it as well as it becomes more of a trend and opens out um, I don't know if anyone else wanted to add to that because I know it's a big topic yeah. at the moment. Yeah I think I think it's about looking at what um, what your brands sort of can get out of uh, the situation as well so um, are you are you looking at more of a reciprocal partnership or is, is it a case of trying to purely get your brand messaging to a, a diverse customer base and it's about trying to as I said I think as a network we have these great relationships with such a such a, a, a variety of brands from from the biggest of the bigs to these more sort of more startup or direct to consumer brands and so I think it's um I think in, in terms of sort of practical approaches it's, it's really thinking about how do you how do you want to approach it um and 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 where the link up is um because i think obviously both brands also have to consider what are they like do the brands go together as well and meld together well enough but as said i i, I as uh, just said i think it if, if it's an area that you're actively really interested in pursuing um it's something that we're we're looking at trying to support as much as possible so do get in touch with your your a win point of contact um on on that point um Cool. So this one is a. Uh, I'm I, I, I'm not too sure exactly what's being asked here, but I think Joel, I think it, it links slightly to sort of travel. So I'm going to direct it at you. Um, and it says, what are your thoughts towards revenue models like Groupon and Woucher 
for the future in regards to COVID um, compared to affiliate marketing models? Um, I'm going to potentially assume that by revenue models like Groupon, we mean sort of like the bulk, the, the bulk selling and the sort of the discounts that they offer there, as opposed to referring traffic to a uh, brand's website like a traditional um, affiliate would do. Um, I think they're always going to serve a purpose Like we've seen a rise in these sort of group buying and, and bulk discount sites for the last several years. And we actually work with Groupon and, and Woucher in both in different capacities and from an affiliate perspective and from a from a brand perspective as well. Um, I think for, for a COVID um, for this environment and like we've been talking about the recession and stuff this is this is probably a really good um, time to start launching some campaigns with some of these partners so one it's a really good way to tackle um, those consumers who potentially have less um, to spend in their wallet at the moment if you do have some offers in terms of big discounts and for those advertisers it's a really strong um, objective in terms of a strategy of getting rid of some bulk product that you might have so perhaps some product that didn't sell during lockdown that would have traditionally sold during the, the traditional summer months where, where we weren't all stuck indoors so I think that there's there's an opportunity there if it's needed. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, 